So good afternoon, Dr. O, and thank you so much for coming back to see us. This is the third session that we've recorded together. Now, maybe the viewer's very first session, so... With that in mind, do you mind just sharing just a little bit about your background with our viewers? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Lana Brzezowska. I live in Canada, in Toronto area, and I've been in Canada almost for 30 years, but I was born in Ukraine, in the West region, and by, <laughs> ed Indeed. Yes. And by education, I'm a physician uh, and by specialization obstetrician gynecologist. So I moved to Canada with family in 1996, it's the end of that year. And uh, I passed exams uh, to be qualified as a doctor, uh, but spent uh, almost like 20 years in Mount Sinai Hospital as a research physician in research area, clinical research, um, because uh, this has happened and I like research by the way. And uh, also I was doing like um, uh, lecturing and uh, participating in continuing medical education courses, like, you know, helping with organizing and, and of these uh, events, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. But I actually uh, started to write books uh, because first I was uh, creating a blog, mostly for uh, people from post-Soviet Republic, republics, because what I realized the methane there is on a very low level and quite corrupt and plus um, very uh, old and, uh, you know, the, the progress there is on a very low level. So that's why I decided to help people to to be some kind of bridge between modern progressive medicine from North America and including Canada and then share this information. I did it for free, but the question was so, like there were so many questions about especially women's health that I decided, okay, instead of repeating answers, I start writing books. And the books were accepted very nice. So I got some offer from publishing houses so there. And then I became known, let's say, famous. And I was on TV, on the radio, and I was lecturing in uh, uh, medical schools and universities, so in Ukraine and even in my alma mater, which is for me uh, an honor to be and to give lectures. And uh, so this is what I was doing for the last, uh, let's say, almost 10 years. Uh, but um, the war in Ukraine actually damaged a lot, like a lot of plans and and um, plans for future. So I start supporting my uh, Ukrainian people in helping them. And uh, I stopped working with Russia, but I, I'm still providing a lot of information and it's very valid and serious and necessary information how to survive. Uh, in the extreme situation, how to be pregnant, how to carry pregnancy in extreme situation, and uh, you know a lot of kind of like um, um, the material I provide to uh, Ukrainian people, and uh, this is who I am. But also, I was interested in psychology. That's why during COVID and, and the last year, also I took a couple of courses. Some of them from. Uh, University of Pennsylvania on positive psychology and uh, which is I'd like to highlight um, the gold standard for us in positive psychology because that's the home of Dr. Seligman, yes. Martin Seligman, who founded the field essentially. And I'm very uh, kind of happy that uh, one of my uh, not colleagues, she's psychologist, let's say, but I know her personally, and she created with Dr. Seligman and other famous psychologist in the world, uh, uh, entire course, Positive Psychology for Ukrainians. And actually it was, um, it was an uh, online course and it took, uh, it was lasting for uh, 12 weeks. Okay. And I just like, yeah. With lectures of all known psychologists from around the world who uh, Dr. Seliman uh, was, uh, lucky or let's say he he was kind to bring as a team mm -hmm. and uh, that's why for me it was like you know a signal that probably I need also to bring some other psychologists from positive uh, association this international association of positive psychology and we 
need to speak to people and um this is that's why i started to do the podcast Wonderful. yeah so this is short but again it's a lot to say and as i said in our private conversation i'm not ready to write autobiography just so <laughs> you're busy letting it write itself yeah, i didn't want to waste time it's, when i'm retired i don't know when i'm retired then i'll start collecting all data and bringing in one book maybe <laughs> well, thank you so much it. for uh, sharing your time with you because you are a very busy woman and you're very active in the international positive psychology association um so we really appreciate it and we have a small group of young women who have gathered their questions for you and as we spoke right beforehand before we begin recording this session You've done your research because you are a research scientist and you are of ready course. for the question. So I'm going to pass the baton. Start with it as you will. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I prefer true information because I'm responsible for sharing this information. That's why whenever I have questions or whenever I have the theme to discuss, of course, I do my research just to provide the best what I can. Mm -hmm. And I know the first question we got, uh, not the first, but I mean the first for this session, it was about pop smear and when to start. Right. Do you mind if I read it? Yes, please. Yes. Right. Please. So how important is it for 18 to 25 year olds to get a pap test? Do they still need to undergo a pap test if they've not been sexually active? That's a wonderful question because it caused a lot of dilemmas between doctors and also between like patients or women, let's say. Uh, before, um, there was a kind of recommendation that every uh, young woman that started the sexual activity, and it means like, you know, sort of vagina not as a type of activity, uh, has to be tested and uh, through this pop smear. Mm -hmm. uh, because what is pop smear? So let me explain in a couple of words. So pop smear, it's uh, actually short, um, this like short name for Papa Nicolau's test or Papa Nicolau's smear. And Dr. Papa Nicolau, it was uh, Gregorius uh, Papa Nicolau. It, he was a Greek physician that in 1920s uh, created this test because he was pathologist also. He yeah. liked to look through the microscopes on a on cell. So he was collecting a lot of tissues, a lot of like, you know, and then uh, he used his wife as, <laughs> as a guinea pig to collect uh, uh, vaginal discharge and actually look through the microscope. And in this way, he found like different changes in, in cells and describe it. Uh, and he moved actually to United States uh, and there was uh, 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 like exploring more, but it took almost 50 years when it came to kind of normal classification because at that time we hardly knew about cervical cancer, especially okay. the time. And it took 50 years and then actually we found that through the cells, through the changes in cells, we can say if we, we have some precancer condition or cancer condition. And it was the base for any other cytological test, like we say, because it's cytology, it means learning the cells. And uh, okay, through the cytology. classification of cells, we can say what kind of changes, good one or bad one. And uh, the first country that started to, sc to screen uh, women on um, uh, cervical cancer was Australia. And approximately in 70s, I guess, I don't remember exact date, but on 70s, Australia created the entire government program, a state program uh, to test every woman in, in Australia and look for these changes. Okay. And that's why they start calling the pop smear because it was a smear. So they actually open uh, and uh, special, like, you know, uh, by special instruments, the cervix, and take from the surface of the cervix, and later they start digging deeper, they start taking from uh, this uh, channel that sells, mm -hmm. like discharge actually, and looking through the microscope. Of course, it was colored by special paint, and then uh, it was like started. But it took another like, you know, 50 years, uh, approximately <laughs> 50 years when every country in the world start doing this, mm -hmm. 
but again, uh, it was the old version of PopSmack. And uh, okay. recently, we start doing a new version. And I know it's, uh, but again, in many offices, you still have this old version, like, you know, when the discharge is dried and then colored, and then they look like, you know, the pathologist looking um, through microscope and describe. But also, we have a new version. It's called liquid cytology, or sometimes they call it um, sure plan, BP sure plan, whatever. There are different companies that create this. When okay. we have this discharge, we use, first of all, different instruments. We use like cytobrush, we call it, or cytobrush. And if we don't damage the, the cervix so much, then we put in a special liquid, and then everything on the brush goes down on the bottom right mm -hmm. and then they use it so they it's much better than just like uh, uh the old way in the old way because okay. we could miss something on the, on on like you know which is still used past. in parts of the world you'd say yes okay. yes depends on the country depends actually on the equipment and depends how progressive the doctor is let's say this okay. way because it's a it's actually already like this liquid cytology at least for 10 years that wide, they widely use in North America and Europe. And then okay. another one new direction, uh, and they, they start to use in this state programs, like screening programs, like we say, for cancer. Uh, it's actually computerized. And it's much better because uh, when you look like with your eyes, of course, you can be tired, you can miss a cell, you can like, you know, the computer looks not just like counting every cell, but the computer mm -hmm. can look through different uh, like different in different directions, like you know, and use filters okay. that can can look much better. And they use a couple of filters which our eye cannot use. That's why we okay. have new technology. But coming back to pop smear, what gives us like you know the pop smear? So before the, but there was no classification, very good classification. Everybody could describe whatever they see in different way, and that's why we could miss a lot of bad things. Okay. Uh, but the SESDA system was created like approximately 50 years ago, and its classification of this changes in, in, the, in cells. And um, you know, we had a new, and then it's actually improving through the time, and we had the new um, addition from in 2013, I guess. After that, I don't remember we've ever had. But so now we have uh, five classes, like we call uh, it's not that, like we never call it classes, but let's say try to explain five description, the main description. Okay, so five different categories. Yes, categories. Yeah, let's say because before we had classes, before we had breaks. Okay. Now it's okay. a little bit. It's simplified that doctors wouldn't do any mistakes. That kind of more uh, like simple to understand what's going on. Right. And right. the first category, it's actually when you get it says negative for. Um, Precancer and cancer condition or intraepithelial lesions, like we say in medical terms. Mm -hmm. So when you get like negative, it means okay, you're fine. Even if there is some changes on the okay. cervix, but it's fine. It's wonderful, wonderful result. You know, so you shouldn't even bother yourself and do something, right? Then another one, it's uh, we found this like ascos. It means a typical cells of uh, unknown, uh, unknown significance, like, you know. So it's, again, it's not pre-cancer. It just could be changes. It could be inflammation, could be repair. It could be anything, like, could be infection. That's why sometimes you might be required to repeat the test in a couple okay. months, you know. Right. Then actually we have the intrapithelial lesion low degree, low grade. And before, many years ago, uh, it was treated as precancer. Now it's not okay. a precancer. Okay. And you can find in many young women, especially when also they're infected by uh, HPV, like human papilloma virus, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not so bad again. It's not precancer. And only high grade, high grade of epithelial uh, lesions we call it like in in a, in an old uh, classification we call it like uh, uh, severe dysplasia or like you know this like high grade dysplasia. Now we don't use word, word, word dysplasia, but it means 
This is, could be pre-cancer. And then the, the last class, of course, we have cancer. It could be like, you know, cancer, a certain cancer. And for each category, there is a very clear description of cells. So of cells. So it means the doctor who's looking through this, or the computer knows itself, but the doctor who's looking through the cells, that he has to describe precisely what he sees to avoid any kind of like, you know, um, mismatch or whatever, like, you know, starting like, like anyway, like wrong description, let's say this way. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's, uh, but we call it screen. Why we don't call it diagnostic test? Now we, I would say we might call it diagnostic test okay. because computerized system when actually the level of mistakes is very low. Okay. We, we can say that it hardly a mistake, but when we use our eyes before, mm -hmm. so then we use this subjective factor, whatever person right. sees. That's why to confirm the diagnosis, we had to do a biopsy. We had to take a piece of tissue and then go in very, like, you know, deep into the structure of this tissue mm -hmm. and then confirm that there are changes or there is no changes, especially when it comes about pre-cancer or cancer condition, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we call screening. And again, it's much easier to do like to screen everyone when right. about diagnostic methods, we talk when we suspect it and we need to confirm or disapprove, right? Mm -hmm. So this is how it works. Regarding the age, regarding the age, uh, as I, I told before, it was recommended that whenever you start like sexual relationship, then you have to be tested. Which but, is a part of this question, the second part. <laughs> yes. So, but actually it's changed in a way that what we have, of course, everything based on clinical research. We're not talking like uh, from nowhere, like we do not right. kind of uh, uh, create our own suggestions. And in a couple of organizations are involved in uh, uh, creating the recommendation. And it's also, it's like some professional medical organizations and some state organization like control, uh, this committee of control disease, right? It might be like National Cancer Institute, it's semi-private organization. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody tries to be on top of everything. So that's why we have a little kind of discrepancy in recommendations. But okay. again, you have to confirm, you have to confirm why you do this way. So uh, in general, we have some consensus. We have some consensus. So now uh, we recommend to test uh, women uh, when they achieve 20, 21 mm -hmm. year, years of age. Why 21? Why not like, you know, um, sooner or whenever they start the sexual relationship? Because according to statistics, the, the cervical cancer, and we're talking mostly about epithelial cervical, because different types, we have like different types of cervical cancer, but the most common it's related to is uh, epithelium. It's like, you know, okay. uh, if you remember something from biology, <laughs> so this is what is covers us. It's like mm -hmm. skin and it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, everything inside. But anyway, when it's, uh, when we're talking about um, uh, the, the uh, Y21 and not like, you know, uh, older. So the, the cervical cancer is a very rare disease, even if okay. we hear a lot. But why we hear a lot, because it's the only program that is implemented so well about the screening. And another second one is the breast cancer, okay? Mm -hmm. But as we have nine actually screen programs, like cancer program is like a colon cancer, it's prostate cancer, it's lung cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, I can add some melanoma, like skin cancer. I mean, we have nine, uh, mostly nine cancers, not in every state of the United States, no, not even in Canada, not in every province, mm -hmm. but in general, nine uh, states. It means controlled by government and sponsored by government because here we have some program how to um, find these cases of early stage of cancers and treat on time and mm -hmm. save person's life, right? And that's why it's supported by government. And that's why we have, we have the okay. state screening programs. But the most successful, actually, it's a con like cervical cancer. The most successful, why? Because it's easy to do. 
So <laughs> you take the vaginal discharge and then you, and that's it. When we talk about other, like even like um, uh, another one I didn't mention, it's ovary screening, ovary cancer screening program. Mm -hmm. It failed, failed in many ways. And everybody now okay. is kind of discussing what we're going to do next because we usually see ovarian cancer when it's too late. So, but it's a program failed. But when we talk about lung cancer, whatever, it's related to some invasive procedures or kind of like x-ray, let's say lung cancer or colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. Even now they improve because now they still look for blood in your stool, which is much easier than mm -hmm. your colonoscopy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but we improve in with years mm -hmm. uh, in the screening programs, but cervical cancer and breast uh, cancer probably is the most developed where tons of money is involved right mm -hmm. but it works uh, even like when we talk about breast um, breast cancer there are some changes because now we don't do mammography every year and but still a lot of confusion but uh, i mean we have some changes when cervical cancer we have changes only in a quality and high level like you know of equipment and uh, this technology we use. But the prestige is the same. We start from PAPSMAN. But again, we have changes. Now, we even in the United States, we have recommendation to start not from PAPSMAN, but start from uh, looking for H, uh, human papilloma virus. Right. Because 80, even 90% of uh, epithelial cancers are related to uh, human papilloma virus infection. Okay. And wow. because we, it's, it's, it's confirmed by many, many clinical research. Mm -hmm. So it means if you had a contact with HPV, it means you have higher chance to get cancer than you never had. Mm -hmm. But this interesting moment that even if you had, because we know approximately 60 young women between 20, 30 years, even a little bit younger, are infected, or had a contact. But our body, our organism is actually fighting the infection. And then up to, up to 90% of women who ever had contact with HPV, approximately in six months, but usually we say in a year, we give okay. more time, uh, they will be cleared of virus. So, so it's we never find any, any kind of confirmation that they were infected, which is good. It means our body knows how to clear off this virus. Uh, we don't know if it's cleared or the virus stays somewhere in neurons or whatever. We have no idea. Just it means it's on a such level that our new like methods cannot detect the virus. But it's okay. We cannot detect. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And you know that's why they say that maybe we should know who is infected, who is not, because mm -hmm. who's infected probably needs kind of uh, uh, more visits to a doctor to have this. And uh, right. to have this pop smears or whatever, because if you're not infected, well, it's kind of very low chance that you will have some changes, like mm -hmm. we call histological changes related to HPV infection, especially with cancer condition. Mm -hmm. That's why, like, you know, they say maybe you should start not from pop smear, but start from HPV okay. um, testing. And they change this recommendation now. But again, it could be done both because there is like co-testing. Also, it's like, you know, right. started being Often. like, yeah. So you, you could hear in the United States, yeah. we do co-test and we do pop smear and we do like uh, HPV test, which is okay. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's normal. And then again, if we got the normal results of, of pop smear, it means even if the virus is present, it means we can repeat in one year. It mm -hmm. means it's still not damaged and, and we cannot treat we cannot treat this infection. There is no medication, no methods to treat infection. We okay. just like follow the, the, the woman and we ask her to come and, and take the, the test again in one year usually, you know. If we okay. see some changes, like simple ones, some kind of little changes, but not pre-cancer, we can say we can retest in one year or six months. But if we have more serious than in three months, let's say, because okay. we know then almost in 60%, even pre-cancer condition in young women, 60% of young women will dis disappear or how we, can, we say will be self-treated, which is good. So mm -hmm. there's no like, you know, push, push. Then another one serious moment that the cancer, to, to develop the cancer takes time. So we found the peak of uh, 
like cancer cases, usually after 40, 45, usually 46 till 51. And it's a huge difference. We know that it takes 15, 20 years to develop mm. the epithelium cancer. Mm. I'm not talking about the other cancers, but only this time. So it means uh, why we should press and push this young women, uh, push them into the stress, stressful situation. Right. Because we say, oh, you know that cancer can be developed. Yeah, but it takes time. So we still have time to check the, the, the uh, condition of the cervix. And what is interesting, they usually when women achieve like 35 years, 40, they hardly visit the doctor mm -hmm. because they're wise, they're not afraid. So they kind of like, you know, they have wisdom of life, let's say this way till that age. And they're not so afraid of cancer, even if they're afraid, but they're busy with children, they're busy with right. business, they're busy. They have like, okay. And they actually healthy most because usually they're very healthy, the healthy population. And that's why well, now many doctors said, maybe we have to change recommendation. Maybe we should push women from 35, like around, like even like 30, let's say, but maybe like older women, like 35, we have to push like for one year checkup, not like, because now we have also, we have checkup every three, five years. If they mm -hmm. do every three five years so if if the if the girl as a young woman goes in 20 and checked and then everything is fine we say come at three five years okay it's mm -hmm. up to you but uh then we say okay but because we start seeing these cases more often after 35 close to 40 maybe we should pay more attention that makes a lot this of sense. category yes so we start kind of losing logic and using the data we have, and probably we will have some changes in the comment. In the, in, that uh, is very interesting. So this individual who wrote this is going to be somebody who's 18 to 25, because this is the demographic that we're working with. Yes. But um, while the question now, from what I understand, and, I won't, and please do correct me if I misinterpret it, is maybe get a pap test um, if you're not sexually active. Definitely get a pap test if you are sexually active because of the HPV virus. Um, uh, yes, but pap test doesn't show virus. So the virus is different test. That's know? right. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, so it, it means be visit your doctor, visit your doctor and do tests. And it's better to start from HPV if you're sexually active. And also they do, they can offer another test like for disease, okay. sexual transmitted diseases, see, because sometimes right. the women, they don't but know. But if one's they, not sexually active. If they never had any sex, like, you know, uh, in vagina, then they probably will not be tested for pap smear, but they might be tested for okay. HPV in some way, because, but again, we don't know what to do with young women, even teenagers who has HPV, because we don't know how the HPV appeared there, uh, because we have approximately 13, 15% Okay. infected with HPV and they never had any sex and it's not about do not do not trust young generation no 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 it's just like we don't know how they because we found that they could be somehow infected and again HPV there are like 135 types even more 140 something every year we get in more types um, and only a few can affect uh, your genital uh, area right so mm -hmm. So whatever you have papillomas here, like, you know, and you'd like, it's also HPV, but it's not hard. It's harmless in some way. It's not related to cancer, but there we have only few one that related to cancer, but also it's related to cancer of rectum. And we have, we know this, and also in men, homosexual men, we have uh, right now increase of cases with um, this um, throat cancer, Different like laryngitis, laryngitis mm -hmm. larynx cancer, right? But I mean, uh, the virus can affect many areas. But when we talk about women, and uh, mostly we're talking about this, um, like uh, traditional sex life, and what also we have, why we said about twenty one, not, not sooner, because statistics show that young generation become a wiser, and women actually get involved in sexual relation in older age. So before it was like 14, 13 sometimes. Mm -hmm. Again, it depends on demographic area, right? So it depends mm -hmm. on the N plus family and the other things. Right. But uh, we look through like average statistic data, right? 
and the, the, the age is increasing because they have education, they have sexual education, right. they have more information, they have teenagers groups like I'm a gal or whatever. So they know more and they are more cautious now. And they start using this uh, preservatives because it's cheaper. And then uh, they know about the sexual diseases. Mm -hmm. So women became more cautious and they start like uh, we had like a couple years ago, the middle age of first intercourse was 19 years, which is wow, right? And then probably now probably a little bit higher. But it doesn't mean that they don't have sexual activity because they can use oral sex and anal sex and mm -hmm. many other types of sexual activity, right? Mm -hmm. And again, uh, when we talk about anal sex, they have to be protected because it can increase the risk of uh, uh, sexual transmitted diseases and also the risk right. of cancer. Uh, because the virus can 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 be passed through anal sex as well, and then through all our sex as well. That's why you have to be like very careful when you like try trying to want to start the sexual life and not mm -hmm. just jump into the first kind of hugs of men, and then you know what I mean. So, but uh, that's why we start saying that probably the age 21 and is another question about the age of majority, like, you know, so before it's always a confusion for doctors, should mother or father, of course, father, come on, but mother be presented during the checkup. Mm -hmm. okay? And uh, even if United States, you find it like if we do the clinical studies, we usually say the woman should be 18 years older. And some, I know some countries might be like 17 years old, but usually 18 years old. But again, it's a very shaky population. And some lawyers and other kind of like people, they say, no, it has to be 21. Okay. And they have a full decision, right? In some countries, uh, okay. Yes. But I want to come to kind of uh, this conclusion that actually is the decision of every, every woman when to start. So is there any kind of fear and uh, is, let's say the woman is like not 21, but 20 or 19 or 18, or she started to have the sexual relationship. And if there is any fear, just go and check, and check yourself. Like, I mean, go to the doctor. Nothing wrong about this. And it's necessary to go to a gynecologist because usually a family physician can do this very easy. I go myself to a family physician when I need all this checkups you know and uh, that's normal so go to your family physician or general practitioner it's simple test what they try to do now they want to create the test like home test and they started to create a home test or during covid infection that's but, wonderful yes yeah, so they can go to the washroom and do the test instruction how to do it like you know uh, but still it's experimental we don't have mm -hmm. valid data if it mm -hmm. gives us like valid information about the condition of uh, the cells, if it's properly taken, you know, and, and why I'm saying why are we creating home tests? Because I remember before we were taking some instrument and then the set of the special brushes, right? Now, when we use computer technology, sometimes enough to take vaginal dis discharge, but always has some, some cells, always it's actually created. Mm -hmm with cells, not just like, you know, a liquid part of, of discharge. Mm -hmm. And that's why the more potential uh, this method, like, you know, high quality masses, they have better ability to find even little changes. So mm -hmm. we were going like in technology way. So we improve mm -hmm. technology and probably one day we will be doing this test at home. So we'll be like, we have this blood blood test for like stool, like blood in stool test. Like remember, mm -hmm. now they send home. So right. you do it at home and then you send it back to the lab. You don't need to go anywhere and you have your private intimacy in your worship and then do right. whatever you want, right? right? So the same we try to do with this test. So maybe in a couple of years, you mm -hmm. don't need to go to a doctor. You can be tested at home. You just order the test. And then you do it and send to the lab. And um, I think it's wonderful because since this way, probably more women um, could test more often 
not every day. But Even the busy women, as you said, um, as the demographic, uh, yes. the research is indicating that women who are a bit older than this 18 to 25 are the ones who are going to be the most risk at having cancer, but they're in a busy period of their life with kids yes. and working. Yeah. But if they can do this at home. Yes. And I think it's wonderful because I myself, I like a comfort. I don't want to go to doctors many times, right? So if I get this test, if I get something right. like that, it would be for me much more easy. And then again, right. it's much more. If convenient. I do something wrong, it would be my responsibility. Again, I'm not going to blame doctor, but that's why I try to do everything properly. I read instruction, not just like I'm knowing how to do everything, right? But I will be reading instruction before the steps. And instruction, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. create it in an easy way that even with mm -hmm. pictures that you just even if you don't know English perfectly but uh, again not not even about English now you can order many languages now but then it has pictures how to do it which is wonderful it is. so so probably you shouldn't worry maybe in a couple of years you will have this test all around or at least they will be provided by doctors or some clinics or some mm -hmm. organization I don't know and uh, we'll have a lot of changes even in the screening program that, uh, but definitely I, I want to say very important words that 99.9% .9 of women would never have cervical cancer. Okay. Okay, because when we look through the statistic, it's a rare disease, even if we hear, hear about it, it's a rare disease. Mm -hmm. So that's why not every tense woman, not every, it's a lie. It's mostly created by some kind of advertisement or whatever, but it's a rare disease. So, and plus, because it's not rapid growing cancer, you will have time to follow yourself, <laughs> like, you know, right. to follow up yourself. You will have time to find out if, have you, if you have any changes or not, if you're interested in your health. This is probably the most important message that don't rush. I use my favorite expression in Latin, Festina Lenta. Mm -hmm. It means, you know, <laughs> be in a hurry, but slowly. It means, okay. not in a hurry, hurry, but it means move, but enjoy life around. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording now. Um, I really appreciate your time on behalf of our young women as well. And thank you again, Dr. O.